Vanessa Reed was going to be with us from PRS New Works Foundation, but unfortunately she is tucked up in bed with influenza. So we are down to just five fantastic panellists <laughs> instead. Um, but they are absolutely experts in their field who are going to be taking us through uh, the challenges that face emerging artists as they come through music college conservatoires and then start establishing their careers. And then later on, how do you keep a career going in the music world? What are the things, the opportunities you should be looking out for? So we're going to be looking at lots of different themes and exploring them in a wide-ranging conversation. But before we do that, can we just pick up very briefly the different aspects of the work that you all do? Michelle, could I come to you first and just very briefly outline for us? Well, I started my career as a violinist, actually trained here at the Guildhall and did about five years of um, professional playing and then moved into the charity sector a little bit by accident, actually. Um, and I've been there ever since and absolutely love it. Um, I um, specialise in, with my business in fundraising and development. Um, the organisation is called Cause4 and we work across um, charity arts, sport and education sectors, uh, supporting organisations to grow and change. Um, and I also have a real passion in supporting um, musicians and actors to be more business minded and have a partnership with the Guildhall School here called Creative Entrepreneurs, supporting um, graduates to set up their own businesses. Thank you. And then moving on to Claire, just, just briefly picking up themes from that in your own line of work in previous aspects. I'm the Senior Grants Manager at the Garfield Western Foundation, which is the largest um, family run trust. trust in the country, giving away about 58 million a year. Um, we support across sectors, um, so I get an awful lot of applications from the arts. Before that, I was a fundraising consultant and worked predominantly in the cultural sector and a fundraiser before that. And I'm a trustee of a national music education charity. So have a kind of another insight, if you like. Brilliant. Coming to Tom now, PRS, oh, sorry, RPS, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so I'm a professional clarinetist. I also trained at the Guildhall and left, well, 11 years ago now. So I'm a professional clarinetist and teacher. I then um, direct projects and planning for the Royal Philharmonic Society, which is the oldest music society in the country, the second oldest in the world. Um, we have lots of different avenues in which we, our work covers. Um, Probably the most famous is the RPS Music Awards, of which the shortlists are announced today on Intune. Um, I'm also um, a, a trustee of a arts fund, um, which, which supports a number of arts organisations. So I suppose I see the profession from a number of different, different areas. And uh, Rebecca, um, just tell us a bit about your experience. <coughs> So I also studied music at Royal Holloway um, and went into working at BBC Music Magazine for a couple of years um, and then left and moved to the dark side of PR um, <laughs> and um, worked in the industry for around 10 years in various places, including um, a small PR agency um, like the one I run myself now, um, who look after London Symphony Orchestra and various other people, um, went to the BBC Proms, <coughs> then English National Opera and then had always wanted to set up on my own and and run my own consultancy, which is what I've been doing for the last four and a half years. Essentially, our role is we help cl our clients, be they an orchestra, an individual, um, <coughs> and on smaller ensemble, we help them to look at what their messaging as an organisation is or an artist and then work to try and um, promote that across all media platforms, which obviously has changed enormously over the last few years, um, be that, you know, print media, um, <coughs> So newspapers, magazines, through radio, television, the ever-growing world of digital, which obviously is the area that has, um, has changed substantially even over the last three years. And Igor, lastly, just share with us where you are in your career. Um, so uh, actually I started out in documentary making, then became an arts journalist, still an arts journalist, but um, mainly I'm here in the capacity as a founding member of the London Contemporary Music Festival, uh, which... I started up with three other, um, three other people uh, about three years ago, and um, yeah. So the first question I'd like us just to explore 
is you are a young student, emerging artist, going through the conservatoire experience, just heading out into the big wide world. What advice would you give them in order to establish and grow a career? So if I could just come to Michelle first, what are your thoughts on this? Gosh, well, I think we've heard a lot about um, the portfolio career, which was about, you know, musicians in particular needed to um, do a number of things, be it um, orchestral playing, teaching, um, education, whatever. I now see the portfolio career as much, much bigger than that. Um, and I think not only is it um, being brilliant at your craft, um, I think it's other things um, on the business side, um, like how do you establish yourself? Um, is there a business that you could set up that could complement your artistic practice? Um, things like networking skills and really knowing your audience, who, who is your craft for? So I see that portfolio um, as a much bigger thing now. Um, and I think that really the conservatoires, but also students from day one in, in an organisation like this should be thinking much broader. You know, you've got to make money when you, when you come out and um, absolutely being brilliant at your instrument is, is really important, but it's not going to be enough necessarily. Uh, just picking up, um, just being good enough at your instrument is not enough. Mm. You've obviously looked at lots of applications from emerging artists. Any thoughts from that experience? Um, yes, I mean, we should, I should say that we don't fund individuals. It's only um, registered charities and established organisations. But there's something that I think is very common to PR and marketing and fundraising, which is having a very simple story to tell. And it's not about you. It's not enough to say, I love what I do. I'm passionate about it. You've got to see the bigger picture and say, you know, the difference you're making to our cultural life, because somewhat that's what someone's going to buy into and be interested in. So I think, um, and it's not c complicated, I don't think it's having a simple message, a simple story, the right people to tell it to, but understanding why they're going to be interested in you. But you need to have that core message that you can then, as we were saying earlier, you can then spin, if you like, to your different audiences, but you have to know what you are and then who you're talking to. Jess's experience? Um, well, I would agree with all, all of those things. I would add that when you are finishing conservatoire, you need to think practically um, as simply as if I'm staying in London and I'm finishing my undergraduate and postgraduate, what do I need to be able to do to survive in London, i.e. pay the rent, pay the bills, and get into a situation where you can live in London and also do what you want to do. And that might mean finding some work in a different area, just so that it liberates your time to focus on what you really, in a sense, really want to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I think you really need to think practically. I also think that you need to think, well, I'm finishing my undergraduate or postgraduate. I might not yet be ready yet. And there's nothing wrong with that. At the RPS, we support a number of artists who have taken several years before they're in a position whereby they're in a, in a stage which we, we can fund. The RPS traditionally funds um, certainly individuals who have finished their undergraduate training or postgraduate training and, therefore, and then need a little bit more assistance. So our mentoring scheme um, focuses on, I would say, pretty much people who are over 25, 26. We, um, we have other avenues, so our composition prize is a prime example, um, and I always like to talk about someone like Cheryl Francis Hode, who applied 12 times before she actually won the prize. Um, and when I, um, and Cheryl's a, a good friend of mine now, when I talked to her about those years, you know, she was saying that, and she still says this now, that she spends probably two days a week, two to two to three, actually going through websites, applications, and looking at the next thing. So she's a composer making a living as a composer, but not, she's not completely 24 seven at her desk writing. You have to maintain that balance and always be looking to the next, the next thing and where the opportunities are. So research is extremely important. You need to know where you sit amongst your peers and in, broad, in a broader context within the, the, the <coughs> arts generally. And um, from my funding perspective, um, I've just finished 
um, going through all of the Sky Arts Academy scholarships for the Music Prize. I'm sure there are some people in here who've applied for them. That's um, five uh, scholarships for £30,000, which are awarded by Sky each year. I have the biggest category, music is always the biggest category, 220 music applications, which I have to sift down to about 20, um, probably even less, maybe about 15. So you can <laughs> see the percentage of where you're up against. Um, I'm not I could talk to you for an hour about those applications, <laughs> but I'm not going to go, go down, down that path. The one thing I would say is, though, that in terms of the contemporary classical and the classical sector, what I found most... Um, distinctive and illuminating was the difficulty in classical and contemporary classical uh, applications to put forward an idea which was compelling and which went outside the arena of the art form. Something which is going to have a bigger impact, something which is going to be appealing and make an impact in education or community or these kinds of areas. Just picking up on that, Rebecca, telling a story. Are musicians good at telling a story? Do they understand what that means? Messaging, <laughs> PR, marketing, etc. No, and I'm always quite surprised uh, at how little understanding um, people have, actually, of that. And, and one of the things that I uh, wanted to say was, it, you know, I, in a way, I sort of come in possibly a bit further down the line, but I think there are lots of things that you can do to help to start build a profile for yourself. And these may sound smackingly obvious, but time and time again, you find that people don't do them. You know, have a website, have clips of yourself performing, um, have a presence on social media, try and start to build up a name for yourself, engage with people on Twitter, um, you know, follow people that are interesting in the industry, start to try and get yourself out there and go to lots of events and concerts and network and, and picking up on what Michelle was saying, you know, networking is absolutely crucial in our industry and if you can start to get your name out there, um, you know, it's amazing what you can do yourself at a, you know, an early stage in your career. You know, I've worked with people who are young artists who are brilliant at this and it helps them on the ladder you know someone like Mahana Svahani the harpsichordist is a brilliant networker um, or another person that springs, springs to mind is is Nikki Spence the singer you know they're great at getting themselves out there and talking to people and also they're very very good at their craft as well of course that goes without saying but you need more than that now and I think that's the, the really key thing um, coupled with that yes absolutely in order for me to get involved and for there to be something to say there has to be a story to tell unfortunately good artist does concert is not a story and a journalist is not going to be interested in that so I often get artists coming to me to say oh I think I need some PR and they don't really have an understanding as to what PR actually is um, and I think that that's really, really key. You know, ultimately, there has to be something to say more and more. You know, it's really tough out there to get coverage, particularly on classical music. Um, the space is diminishing on the arts generally. Um, papers are struggling. So actually, you, you're not going to get something in unless there is, you know, a really interesting dialogue to say, you know, it's a new piece, it's, that's, it's set in a quirky place, or there's some <coughs> backstory about it, or about you indeed, that, you know, is interesting. Human interest is always something which editors are, are interested in, as I'm sure, you know, Igor would be able to touch on too. Um, so I think it's really having an understanding that, you know, it has to be more than just, yeah, I'm a really good artist and, and I'm going to do said Bach concert or, or whatever it is. So it needs to come with a bit of a twist. It needs something else yeah. in there. Absolutely. Igor, can you pick up some yeah. of those themes well, I mean, for us? That twist has got to be natural and, you know, it has to have some authenticity. I mean, when people add a twist when there is no twist there, <laughs> and there shouldn't be a twist. <laughs> we were talking about kind of, you know, if you're doing a Haydn string quartet, just do the Haydn string quartet. Don't, you know, get some dancers or jazz up the lighting. No know. flashing lights. No flashing lights. I think, you know, uh, just play really well. Uh, but it, there is, I do try, I mean, I think one of the reasons why we set up our, our company was because we were quite angry. And I think anger is a really helpful source for, for figuring out uh, new territory. I mean, it's where, you know, I think of Boulez in the, in the 40s. I mean, Anger and, and realising that someone is doing something wrong 
and you're really annoyed that you know, they're not doing it in the right way and you think you know how to do it in the right way is a really good spur for carving out a possibly a new idea, a new, new, new way of doing something. Um, I, also, I also think, you know, sort of, yeah, th th there's, two, there's, two, there's two things that um, um, uh, have been said that are quite interesting kind of in terms of um, uh, applications. So, yeah, so you, you, there are a lot of people who keep on applying and, and, and don't, are not successful. Don't let that put you off and, you know, do, do something, uh, d d possibly have, an, have a, have a sideline, have a moonlight uh, and and because actually you know not succeeding in applications is might be uh, the might be a reason why you're doing something right I mean I'm thinking of I'm reading Philip Glass's biography at the moment and whatever we think of Philip Glass now uh, you know in in the 60s and 70s he was producing extraordinary things and uh, he was he was rejected by everyone mm. and if you think about all the composers who won all the applications won those Pulitzers who do we remember from that time, from the 70s and 80s? Which, which works do we remember you know, by these great Pulitzer Prize winning, foundation winning, academic you know, composers from the 70s? No one. But you, know, you, you see a sellout performance of music in 12 parts you know, at the festival hall last two years ago. And you know, when that was premiered, there were more people uh, on stage than in the audience. Uh, he was 42 before he became a full-time composer, 42. Mm. He was uh, cabbying, even after the success of Einstein on the beach, because he had to pay off the debts, because he always paid his musicians first. That was his first rule. He, so he never took anything home, even though he had the two children. Uh, to, so it's an you know, incredibly inspirational story. He was a furniture removal man. He was an extra on films. He was a plumber. He didn't know how to plumb. He used to go. That's not, not rare. You know, he used to go. He used to go to the, the equivalent of, um, you know, the, the, the hardware store, and with a U bend or a crankshaft, and say, "So, uh, what do I do with this?" And they say, "Well, you have to put it here, and you need this kind of washer." I said, "Yeah." And then, what do I do with that? And basically, he picked up how to plumb by asking for the parts that he that, that he needed for each job. And slur, you know, he was doing sinks, then he did showers, then he, you know, <clears throat> and he built up a career out of it. He was an assistant to Richard Serra for four years. You know, that's, you know, remember that the other art forms are, uh, you know, possible um, uh, friends in this. You know, uh, some of the art forms are doing better than us, uh, especially the visual arts. So take a look there. You know, there are good jobs to be had there, and there are things you'll learn. You'll actually grow if you work with some artists. Or, some, or uh, maybe in film, you know, he worked on, he was an extra, as I say, mm. he never actually got in a film because he used to, he used to realise that if you, if, you did, if you sort of did very little, they wouldn't show you on screen or whatever, so he never got into a film. Mm. But he still got paid. Mm. Uh, anyway, so, you know, th this is... This, there's this a, is there's definitely remembered. tips for all aspiring musicians yeah. um, just to hold on to. But, Michelle, just coming back to um, how our musicians are being prepared for the future, they're obviously now taking on a lot more debt than they used to. Is that having an impact on how they view their experience at conservatoire? And is it changing what conservatoires are offering their students? Gosh, a controversial question. Um, I, I mean, I think it is. I, I think if you're um, paying um, £9,000 in fees a year, then you are thinking pretty seriously about what you're getting mm. and, and therefore what the end game is. Mm. Um, and I think um, by necessity and, and quite rightly, conservatoires therefore um, need to be more marketing driven because they're, they're responding to customers, um, you know, just as universities um, have to. Um, so I, I think um, I, I, we were reflecting on, on this um, earlier when I left the Guildhall sort of um, 15 years ago, the, their job, absolutely and quite rightly, was to prepare me to be as, as good a violinist as I possibly could be. And it did feel to me that I was then on my own suddenly. And that's changed massively because I think um, with the tuition fees, there, there has to be an end game of what job and role are you going to be prepared for as mm -hmm. part of that training, mm -hmm. in my view. And entrepreneurialism, obviously we're going to be looking at that in the last session today. There's been some work happening, I think, at Guildhall around this. Anything you'd like to share from that programme? Um, well, Guildhall um, I, I have been very forward thinking, I, I, I think. Um, so they've set up a, a scheme called uh, Creative Entrepreneurs 
um, which is um, coming into its third year now, which is to support um, graduates with a business-ready idea um, to be able to set up their own um, businesses. Because, um, you know, my, my view, and when I have time, I'm going to write some, um, some research on this, is that uh, musicians and, and actors have the potential to be brilliant entrepreneurs because of the training they've been through. You know, they know how to perform, they know about success, they know about failure, uh, which is practice. They, 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 all those things that um, the conservatoire education prepares um, people for. Um, and Creative Entrepreneurs is a 12-month programme going through some of the things that you wouldn't cover in a conservatoire education necessarily because uh, there isn't room for it because you have to be prepared to be as good at your craft as possible. So things like business skills, networking, fundraising, all those things. And I think, um, again, it, what I was saying earlier about portfolio career, I think um, being a brilliant violinist is one part of it, but also being able to market yourself and have your own business that maybe runs alongside or is fundamental to your career mm -hmm. is also really important. And I think the Guildhall programme is working with graduates to be able to do that. So if you haven't been fortunate enough to be on that programme, where are you going to learn your marketing skills, your PR skills from? Any ideas? Where do they come from? Talking to people, I think. I think, again, it comes back to this networking um, scenario of get out there and actually have conversations with people and learn from people. There's so many people out there who are willing to mentor, guide, help, you know, get a bit, get someone in the industry who's got a, a business knowledge and, and info who can mentor you and, and give you some guidance. And I think that would just help so many people. Mm. And I think um, if you ever ask somebody for their advice, it's very rare that they say no. I Everybody completely loves agree. their advice yeah. to be asked. That's why we're all here. Uh, but it is true. I mean, and I, you know, that's why you get organisations doing feasibility studies. They're testing the water before they actually go and do something. And I think um, coming back to Rebecca's point earlier about networking, I think, you know, I've had to train board members of organisations how to go and ask for money. The great thing about musicians and actors is you're performers. You can put yourself behind if necessary and bring out this performing element. So you keep something safe inside, which some people cannot do. So networking should, in theory, be easier for you guys. Right. Uh, empathy. I mean, or just, under, I mean, train your brain to understand what it might be to be an audience member. Or, yes. a, or, a, or an editor, you know, just, you know, uh, just think outside of yourself. I mean, why, why should that person, when he's got this many options, you know, give your, um, your thing the you know, time of day? Because it's, it's not just money, is it? It's time. Because there's lots of other things that anyone can go and do. They can spend their evening on Twitter or Facebook or mm. anything else. So why should they come yeah. and listen to you? And time is the thing that everyone is so increasingly short of and I think that's a really key point actually is that you know we live in a world and particularly the world that we're all working in where it just seems that everyone is stretched and stretched and stretched to the limits and everyone has less and less time um, so I think that's a, that's a really key point is that you know you want to invest your time well and wisely. Don't be afraid to be counterintuitive I mean I think you know uh, you can you know, you, you can use Twitter a lot or you can become the incredibly mysterious person who doesn't use Twitter, <laughs> you know? That works as well. I mean, there are these figures who, you know, essentially their marketing is not having any marketing. So remember, that is an, also another way of doing it. But how do they generate is a, profile then if there's no marketing? Well, because through word of mouth. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, there is, there is such a thing and it still exists and people go, my God, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there's uh, quite a few... I, I guess someone like um, uh, Scott Walker, you never see interviews with him every time, every week in The Guardian. In fact, you know, those people that you see every week in The Guardian, you're very likely to get very bored of very quickly. So you've got to be careful and savvy and think counterintuitively, always against the trend, mm -hmm. always against what everyone else is doing, you know? Always think that way. OK, so tell us a bit about Found Space then, because I think you've been using a, is it a carpet warehouse? Yeah, well, we were, well, we were, I mean, this is, this is, you know, actually undermining my point because we totally, <laughs> totally jumped on that bandwagon um, of, of using Found Space, uh, which has been going around uh, for, for a decade, at least, in theatre. Um, it hasn't been, it has, it has actually gone on in classical music as well, mainly in experimental music. I mean, it was very funny, actually, the, you know, the, second year, the first year when we had Charlemagne Palestine come, who's an experimental pianist, uh, you know, we thought it was very exciting that we were doing something in a car park. 
And he said, ah, I've played five car parks, you know, in 1954. <laughs> so, you know, every idea has been done before. But, you know, people forget. <laughs> That's quite a useful thing. Amnesia, cultural amnesia is very useful. Um, uh, so, you know, the, so the first place we did our thing in was a car park. Uh, it was a, a, an, art, an art gallery as well. Um, and so it made sense. It wasn't just... Um, flippant um, and it, it did make sense to do I mean I, I do think that space shapes music and you know this is something we don't think about we think that we're you know given a concert hall and that's that and this whole relationship is set well it's not you know it's an 18th century construct you know uh, that's you know really to do with so the social conditions of that time for me it makes no sense to do it in a space a concert in a space like this when it comes to new music so we were, all, we're always looking for spaces where you can you know, fiddle with space. You can maybe have an installation around the musicians like we did last year, or you can have the musicians around the audience or the audience inside the piece, or, you know, electronic music cannot work in a space like this. Something like Francois Bale or something, you need surround sound. So, you know, and, and, uh, or maybe you can do it here, maybe. Uh, anyway, so uh, it, this is the important thing with found space. It... it, 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 it it is a gimmick and, uh, as well, and, 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 and some people have used it just as a gimmick. I hope we've actually m made a, a logic to it uh, beyond it being an interesting thing in itself. But I think space in itself is interesting. And people, you know, surface, we shouldn't be so sort of snooty about surface and visuals mm. and space. These are things that other people do for a living. You know, I know we think that, you know, this abstract thing we write down is the most important thing in the world. But, you no, know, architecture is important too. You know, space, mm -hmm. what your walls are like, you know, whether the columns should be there, there, mm -hmm. what you wear. Mm -hmm. You know, fashion is an actual, you know, serious thing. I mean, it's not, you know, so uh, this, I don't think we should, you know, um, I mean, not that we think about that, but, you know, one, one you know, we shouldn't be so sort of um, close-minded to all these other things that do affect uh, how music is played. Okay. Tom, just coming back to you, um, we were chatting beforehand around collaboration. Mm. Have you got any thoughts around that and how it can work positively for musicians? Uh, collaboration <laughs> and cross-arts work has been around well, for centuries, but it, it's very much been in, in, in the forefront over the last 10 years. So much so that I'm sort of getting to the point where um, I'm, I'm sort of over it in a bit. Having said that, um, I think it's really, it can be really powerful because as Igor's touched on, different disciplines come about a performance or a production in different ways. I've done a lot of work with contemporary dance and dancers just get on and do it. They're, all, they're also paid far less than musicians as well. Um, so I think, you know, if you can, if you're, say, a composer or you're a performing musician, become aligned to a filmmaker or dancers or visual artists or even someone who's um, in architecture, they expose you to different disciplines, different contacts, different worlds, which can be really, really fruitful. I mean, one of the projects which I've just more or less finished with now has been um, actually a, a, a project funded by the PRSF, so it's a pity Vanessa's not here. Um, but that was working with a filmmaker and a, um, <coughs> a composer. In fact, Rebecca was in charge of the PR for that, pro for that um, um, project. So it just shows you, actually, I, I did smile to myself when I saw who was on the panel, <laughs> because the music world is an incredibly small world. So you, you absolutely need to network, you need to know everyone, but then you also need to go outside of the music world. But that project, to me, really highlighted a number of things. It highlighted quality, because I knew both artists were of a quality which I knew they would produce something which was really good. Um, the brief was to do something cross-arts, so I was looking at the budget and what the funds were available for it, and I knew from my experience that practically certain things would not be possible. So I chose to do something with film because I knew that although the film budget can be limitless, it can also be quite contained. And from a practical point of view, when you're touring a filming project, um, 
more or less, it's much easier than touring with a troupe of dancers or a, or a big ensemble because of the costs. And something which you also need to remember when um, doing project budgeting, if you're a producer or curating something, is that the cost of live musicians is actually really expensive. And that's something our art form has to contend with because for most art forms, the costs are significantly less. So I, I know we always wish musicians were paid more and there was more funding for that, but relatively speaking, performers do get paid, musicians get paid quite well. Um, so there was quality, um, there was um, this sense of cross arts and looking at budgeting and, and the practical way. But also I was, I was quite savvy and, and thinking what could work because both um, artists were women. And there's a big um, emphasis at the moment that there are not enough women composers coming through, women artists, and gender is still an issue. And so I was thinking actually this project would be really great to put on for a platform of two really good female um, um, artists, one filmmaker, one composer, and give them that platform. What was really good about that project is it wasn't, um, you know, the women thing wasn't kind of headlined like this, no. you know, no. it was, it, it, you know, you were allowed to just realise that as, as you realised the work was good, yeah. which I think is key for any kind of, yeah. you know, use of those sort of ideas. So I, I know Vanessa isn't here today, but clearly um, her organisation is very important, uh, new, commissioning new works. Can you just, from your experience of working with, with PRS, just take us through that process a bit? I know it's a bit unfair because you, you don't actually work for them, but just having done that project. Well, I think the first thing to remember about PRSF is that they do have funds. So if anyone doesn't know about them, you really should know about them. And I think a pr one practical point of view is that you should have a list of all these different sources, be it ISM, PRSF, RPS, all those different organisations, know when the deadlines are, put them in your calendar, work backwards. People are horrific about timing and deadlines and project management in terms of doing bids. It takes time. You need people to proofread them. You need them, you need them to be distinct and concise. So um, there's that point of just actually knowing about these organisations and working practically in terms of timelines. Um, the other thing, the thing I think which is really striking about the PRSF is that it doesn't just support classical music, it supports other musics. So if you're someone who is crossing both camps, um, you need to see it diff at different stages. I mean, if you're applying to the PRSF in, in, in terms of a project and going to them for funding, um, <coughs> with my RPS hat on, we've, we've had a very long um, partnership with them and they've they funded a number of our projects. Um, but there are two things I would say. Firstly, in terms of applying for funders, a lot of the funders are under pressure at the moment because of the financial crisis and their revenues they're getting from investments are significantly less. So I was talking <coughs> to Vanessa about this a couple of weeks ago and, and, and they are under pressure because they haven't got enough money to go around. And conversely, more people are wanting to go for things like this. Mm -hmm. So it, there's a sort of a backward thought in the, in the back of my brain, which is saying, well, you need to be aware of all these different funding streams and ways in which to build your career, move you forward, but also think outside of them because those are becoming saturated too. Um, and the other point I would just say about the PRSF ap applications is sometimes, and it's not just them, they expect you to send in one A4 sheet of information and that is only the space you have. You might have about five questions, six questions, seven questions, and they'll all be 100 words each. And how do you sell that, um, your project, in that <coughs> limited space, <coughs> also having in mind that you might be one of, since in the term of Sky Arts, one of 220? And from my background as being one of those people, I'm sure Claire will have things to say about this too, <laughs> is that you have to be absolutely distinct, direct, and pithy. No waffly, arty language. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Because what I'm looking for when I'm reading one of those things is, okay, what is it? Why are you doing it? Who's it going to reach? How are you going to do it? Etc. And it can be really pithy. And I think for artists, we're so used to emotion and, get, and, and being very lyrical about our 
our concepts are, of, uh, and our ideas that we forget that the people who we are applying to are not reading them through those lenses. They're reading them through a business mind. They might be lawyers, they might be financiers, they might be just business people. And they're used to seeing pithy, organized statements which get to the point quickly. Claire, just coming back to you, because mm. you shared a little anecdote with us before coming onto the stage about budgets and adding up. Mm. Do you want to just share that? Yes, <laughs> although I would just like to add to your point. There is room for the more ephemeral um, language as well. And I totally agree with you. I get mm. sick to the back teeth sometimes of reading pages and pages of waffle. Arts is not the worst sector for that, let me just add. Um, <laughs> so, but there is something about art for art's sake. You know, this our cultural life would be devoid if we didn't have art and music. So don't rule that out completely. Mm. But yes, try and be concise, because from a funder's perspective, it is a really crowded marketplace. And mm. trying to be distinctive in that so that they remember your application is really tricky. An application that sticks in my mind, um, bless them, and this was a couple of years ago, a tiny collier band in deepest Wales was the only thing pretty much keeping this community together. They were struggling for funds. We, for us, did quite a big chunk of their funding. We don't usually do that. So there is something, you are allowed to tug at heartstrings too. Mm. And, so your point on budgets, please add them up. It is every funder's bugbear. And I know this from talking to most grant makers. People forget to either tell you how much a project costs and then they don't add it up. So fundraisers have to get their calculators out and it really irritates us. It's just a really simple trick. And on our website, um, I've actually written a very simple guide to making an application, which is across sectors. And please use it. I wrote it and it, it can be used for anything. <laughs> I wrote it from having been a fundraiser and then getting awful applications. And it's not rocket science. It's really not. It is, as you said, the how, what, why, when, how much. Don't forget that how you're going to fund it, and then if you really want to at the end, a bit of, it's lovely. That's okay. <laughs> the other two things I was going to mention are estate agents. Befriend them. You know, the losers in the bad suit in the party, just, just go up to them and befriend them, because, <laughs> you know, I, I know people from the RCA uh, who put on a, an amazing uh, show in a disused building in Farringdon Road, in the heart of the city, and basically, they were friends with someone from Savills, and they gave it to them for nothing, and it uh, helped. You know, they, they, there was some, there was some, you know, they were diddling the books, or whatever, by, by saying that, you know, it was occupied for that period. They didn't have to pay tax. Aww. Just remember that. You know, you're doing them a favor, and uh, you're doing yourself a great favor. So, corporates, estate agents, you know, people that we look down on, you know, we need to befriend them. <laughs> We need to befriend them. I mean, the, you know, our, our first year, basically, we were too... Yeah, I mean, we're all bad at doing things in time. And we were, we were terrible in our first year. We had three months to go. And so the only way that we got any money was by me cold calling every corporate that I could find and also doing some other things that were, you know, like getting a lot of contacts of friends and um, uh, them sort of getting it. In, 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 in interesting ways. And so just get contacts, you know, big, borrow and steal contacts and cold call corporates, um, brands. You know, there's, the, the, we're living in a, you know, classical music is no longer just to do with, you know, universities and foundations and state money. It's to do with corporates, you know. Mm. The, uh, mm. If you, 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 we can't, you, you can make it work for them. It's the, it's the last art form to, to go that way and I have no idea why. Um, but, you know, the arts has been doing this for decades. It's getting into a lot of trouble, actually, because of the amount of money they're getting from mm. Deutsche Bank while also doing something very radical. You know, but, but do it. You know, these banks, they don't mind what you do. That's the great thing about banks. They don't care as long as, as, long as they get some cachet, some kind of, you know, street cred out of it, and you don't mind sort of selling your soul a little bit. Um, they don't care what you do. I mean, you know, in our first year, we had Dow Jones, you know, evil company, right? Uh, probably, you know, to a lot of people. Um, and, and yeah, you know, they let us do all sorts of stuff. Um, they didn't know half of it. Um, you know, they didn't really look through the program. They just wanted a dinner. We put on a dinner. 
you know, and they gave us money for the rest of it, and we, you know, got to do... I, got see, to... I see... Hang on. I think that's a very, very unusual experience. Normally, corporates will give you time, so they'll give you people. They won't give you cash, and it's cold calling... I would never advise doing it. And I know well, Michelle would say the same to her clients. in our first year, and Agnes B and Dow Jones funded us. So I think it does work. Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's not my experience at all. I mean, I, I think um, I see a lot of charities and individuals as well. So you're not that much. That would be the last place I would go at the moment. Um, and I think... At the moment, this was about two, three years ago, so okay. this might, might be a different climate. Let's just go back to another point, which is this business point that, again, we touched on beforehand, uh, going back to the RPS and the RPS's roots, mm. and I think we also touched on the ISM's roots mm. and where that came from, that mm. a lot of these organisations <coughs> came out of uh, what was happening in the industrial north or with business people around RPS. Just, just touch on that, Tom. Yeah, I mean, London has always been a global hub, a trade centre, and therefore there's money, there's trade, there's people. So when you have that, you then have a need for arts. In, 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 I'm being very broad here. What you had in the, in the early 18th century, in the 19th century with the RPS, is a group of founding members who wanted to come together and, put, and create uh, the first classical orchestra in London and the first regular concert series. So the, that was the main criteria for the RPS and to commission new music, and no one else was doing it at that time. So it gave birth to this classical music scene in that sense, um, in, in, in an ordered way. But the point which I, I think is useful to remember is that these people, although they were musicians, were the leading business people in the arts at that time. People like Kramer, um, Novello, uh, Clementi, George Smart. You know, these people knew the composers. They had links to businesses. They had their own businesses, be it printing or um, teaching, et cetera, et cetera. They, just, they weren't just musicians. And so I think the, the, the point to remember is that throughout history, there has been this link with money, trade, business, and the arts. You know, you look, at, you look through the, the, um, the Victorian <coughs> times, and you look at the development of the piano, of the piano, of amateur music making, of sheet music. All of them go together with this proliferation of music societies and with orchestras. You know, after the RPS came the, uh, the RLPO in Liverpool in the 1830s, and then the Halle in the 1840s. There's no, there's no um, mystique or magic there. They were industrial towns. So you, you try to think that there is a, a, a relationship which can be had between business, making money, and the arts. It's not, they are not separate camps which can't um, live um, side by side together. That's an interesting point to now go to the audience, because I'm sure people will have questions for our very experienced panel. Uh, so I think we've got two roving mics, hopefully. Um, so who's going to be the first person? And if you could say who you'd like to direct your question to as well, that would be helpful. There's a gentleman in the middle-ish here. And just say who you are, as and when the mic gets to you. Hi, this is, uh, I'm Jason, a student, and I'm, uh, this question is more directed towards uh, Igor. Um, as an experimental contemporary composer, one of the things I find lacking in um, the career as a composer is the information. I find there's far more information about performance, even in contemporary. Um, what advice would you give myself and others in here who are looking into experimental composition? And what type of information? Sorry. What kind of information are you looking for? Ad um, advertising, getting your uh, compositions out there to be um, performed, um, sold, examined, etc. I'll just come in on that, actually, because there are quite a few useful websites out there. I don't know if you follow Sound and Music, but uh, if you're a, a composer, you should certainly be following Sound and Music. 
Um, there are quite a lot of uh, competitions that come off that particular body. Obviously, RPS does composition prizes. ISM has done that. Uh, PRS, we've talked about. So it's really a question of knowing all those networks. And then, again, if you look at the ISM website, we've got quite a lot of stuff around the nuts and bolts of contracts, for instance, which are really important for composers. So there is information out there. It's just a question of finding it and then tagging it. Eagle. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of composers have often found this and, you know, what have they done? They've started up their own ensembles, started up their own programmes. You know, some of the most innovative um, festivals have been started up on the back of composers doing new things that no one else wants, and so they have to do it their, in their, on their own terms, in their own way. I think that's, that, that, that is something that all of you guys have to think about, is doing it yourself, um, not waiting for the festival hall or Barbican to knock, because they don't do experimental stuff, okay? You know, they, 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 this is their 20th century models, you know? Um, it's sort of establishment composers, networks, things like this. You know, um, you need to start your own um, uh, companies, your own ensembles, your own um, festivals. That's the only way that the really interesting underground scene gets, gets to be done. That's how it's always happened. Um, but I think, you know, networking is so important. I mean, I, I, there is, you know, I can tell you a few sites, but they might not be quite right for the kind of music you compose or whatever. But I'd say that the, the, the way that I've got to know about composers is by meeting them or at festivals that I think are, are worth going to or, you know, hanging around Cafe Otto, you know, every night. Um, Tom, did you want to come in there? Very briefly, just to say that festivals, absolutely. Um, I can't think of any festival which has not got some form of commissioning and link with composers now. Ensembles do, you know, so do get mm. out. I mean, many ensembles, if it's you know, small or the larger, orchestras do um, and then the, the other point I would just say is that if you are going to make something your own and set up your own festival in your own area really do think about the community in which you are setting something up who is it for where are you placing the venue will you attract an audience um, because if it's you, you might really want to do something in the heart of oh goodness I don't know Balham. But if, it, if, if it's not, you know, if you've not assessed the area and looked at venue audience, will people come? It's not going to work. So you need to think about those logistical points. Okay, good, good answer there. Um, I think there's a question down towards the front here. Again, just say who you are and who your question is for. Um, Robert Hugill. I, I wanted to pick up on, it's for everybody really, but I wanted to pick up on something that was only been touched on very briefly by Igor which is the issue of fashion and looks. Um, I'm a blogger and my partner did a degree in fashion and textiles and we were at a major competition recently and he commented that it was a shame that the, uh, the other members of the ensemble had coordinated on the young lady's dress because the dress did nothing for her. And there's another occasion when in, at a proms performance, David said that it's a shame that the soprano's dress didn't actually fit. And do you feel that not enough is done to help performers who are putting themselves... I'm not just talking about the, the big gigs. It's mm. put, you're putting yourself out there as you or as a performer, and not enough is done to help you with the, the visual styling to get your look right, to tell the right story. I'm going to take this to Rebecca, actually. Any thoughts Thanks. on... No, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> dress, dress and presentation. No, I, th I think it's really important. Um, and I think a lot of it is common sense, actually, is, you know, looking at something and making sure that, you know, you feel presentable and you feel good. And actually, mm. I think that goes a really long way, mm. is that if you, if you feel good in something, then actually you'll carry yourself well and you'll, you'll mm -hmm. look good and have a good presence. I don't think it's just about what you wear as well. It's about how you actually present yourself on stage and, and you know, et cetera. And I think that's, re that's really important. So it's not just about what you're wearing, it's about how you wear it, I think, as well. Yes, um, would be indeed. I would say. Tom, you're nodding a lot. Well, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think design, design and presentation, but particularly design, mm. is really important yeah. nowadays. And, um, you know, you, you only have to think about that old adage of, oh, well, someone walks through for an interview and you assess them in 12, you know, in 12 seconds or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It really does make a, it really does, um, make a difference. And, I mean, 
The short answer I would just say is get someone else's opinion as well. Good advice. You know, but I, think it's a, I think it's a bit of a taboo that needs to be bust, which is this idea that, you know, I mean, clothes have always mattered, not just in terms of, you know, uh, just formality or... Pol pol it's an art form, yeah. you know? You've got to realise this. It's a serious thing, aesthetics. And I think a lot of musicians don't get that, don't get that. Clothes are not just some sort of frivolous thing that you think of at the last minute, or talking about clothes is not some, you know, superficial thing. Um, actually, what you're saying by dressing badly is it, it would be like saying that your favourite literature was Dan Brown. That's what you're saying. You're saying, aesthetically, I don't get it. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you are. And so, so if, you, if, you, if you think you're cultured and if you want people to take you seriously as a cultured human being, then think about the colours that you walk around in and how those colours might show up on different colours. Think about form. Mm. This is about form. These are about things that you will be doing in your compositions. And people think that it doesn't apply to clothes. It's absurd. Michelle. I think it's just a bit more than that. Yeah, so with the creative entrepreneurship that we do, and brand obviously is, is about clothing and how you present yourself. But it's also about what you stand for and what you bring to the world. And we, mm. we talk a lot, actually, in terms of blogging, about you know, what are the three things that you're going to blog about that you want to come across to the world? OK, so that word brand, let's just explore that word brand. What does it mean in the terms of an artist, Michelle? Everything from, you know, what do I stand for as an artist? And what do I want to say to the world? I mean, I think it's just about what you stand for. You know, what do I actually want to be known for? What do I want to be known about? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say about the world? What do I want to say it's about being a bit strategic yeah. about it as well and actually having a vision for what you want to present, you know, mm -hmm. touching what Michelle was saying. You know, whilst, you know, it, it's very nice to kind of have amusing and, 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 you know, splurge what you want to say, actually remembering that it's a public forum as well and people can, anyone can see it. So actually, 10 years down the line, you know, do you want someone to be reading that that's, that's still there? It's actually thinking, thinking about those things and, and having an awareness of, of what you're trying to say. Okay, another question. Lady in the front, just down here. They're all in the middle, which actually is quite tricky <laughs> for the uh, microphone carrier. Tell us who you are. Hi, um, I'm Hannah Kendall and um, I'm a composer. Um, thank you for all of your really practical advice. It's been really encouraging. Um, and before I did my master's in composition, I actually did a master's in arts management where I learned um, all of the things that you've been mentioning about the industry itself, about business, about PR, about arts, um, education, outreach, all of that. And it was incredibly invaluable. Um, but my question is, um, it might be controversial, and I don't think I mean it to be, but does it um, sort of let the industry off a bit by all of um, you know, us musicians and composers um, making something from nothing? I'm a huge believer of that. Um, I'm producing my own opera at the moment because I do have those skills as well as the musical skills. But um, I, you know, I picked up on the fact that Igor mentioned that you know, Philip Glass was... Um, um, 42 when things really kicked off but then you know also Tom the two um, competitions you mentioned um, sort of you know the age cut off is 28 and 30 um, respectively so by all of us being incredibly entrepreneurial which I do believe in does that mean that um, the decision makers um, aren't doing as much so you know composers are only earning on average three thousand five hundred mm -hmm. pounds a year from their music could we be paying composers more lots of women composers are doing great projects outside of the box but it's still not really connecting with the percentage of women composers on the books of publishers for example so there's lots happening bottom up but is there even more that can be happening from the top down to support the musicians coming up in the industry that's to the whole panel sorry that's okay no no question. I think there's a it's a really interesting point there um you've obviously got a lot of activity going on in the undergrowth and is anybody hearing it really it's the bottom line question and I think if if I can just kind of make the observation that without that activity probably nothing ever would change 
So at least we've had Radio 3 becoming much more cognizant of women composers. And through the work that my organisation has been doing with the ABO, the Treasury has now announced the orchestra tax break, which is going to be much more useful for composers than in its first iteration. And that was as a result of advocacy. So I think you have to almost have a pincer movement. You have to have the people you know, creating, but you also need to have that other part of the music sector being advocates for women composers or tax breaks or whatever it may be. Um, I don't know whether um, Tom or, or Michelle, would you well, like I, to I come in? Got, I think it's a brilliant question, and I think it's something that each of you has come to the question. I'm aware I'm sitting um, alongside <coughs> the esteemed fund here, but I, I, we're having to change as individuals and organisations massively quickly because of the economy and, and, and the context. Um, and I think, and I see it as a I see it with funders as well. Some of them are trying to respond to those uh, challenges, but it's not happening as quickly as actually individuals and organisations mm. need to be able to operate mm. in the way that they do. So I'm really concerned about the funding in their yeah. context because I don't think it's responding rapidly enough. I think that's a really interesting point. OK, I'm, we've only got five more minutes left. So I'm going to go to the person right at the back there with a hand up. Again, say who you are and who the question is for. Uh, Hi there, um, my name's Clouds, I'm a soprano um, and I've led some of my own projects. I've um, fronted a small opera company where um, the everyone involved was also performing um, and I've also done a, um, a socially motivated opera project. Um, my question, which I suppose is to the whole panel, is that um, I've struggled getting um, other people to take my work seriously since that I, since I've been putting on most of my performances myself. How do we how do we get around that, and how do we get these people to take our work more seriously? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tom. Any <laughs> ideas? <laughs> um, I'm just struggling about when you say you want people to take your work more seriously. I mean, which people specifically are we talking about? Funders or people in the profession or both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, my next point is then, where is all this activity taking place? And people can, can people get to it? And how is your marketing? And how is your... Because uh, I, I, I don't really know many, much of the specifics. I get the, the underlying point, but... Um, so the, the things that I've um, been involved with have um, were performed at the King's Head Theatre and the Arcola Theatre, respectively. Um, then it's not it's not a small thing. It's it's quite a small thing as things go. But and we we crowdfunded the first one and we crowdfunded for the most part the second one. Um, Sex Workers Opera has been featured in the Independent, so we we have had quite a lot of good exposure. The other one less so. Um, but it was a fairly specific market, um, and within that, it got promoted quite well. I, mean, I don't know if you want to come in on this, Rebecca, but I mean, I, I mean it, it sounds it, as if you're doing good stuff. But it, it, just... it, it does, and I think it's actually, it's almost difficult to, without sort of starting a more in-depth dialogue, I almost think it's difficult to yeah. answer the question in a way. I almost think we, sh you should, we should talk to you at the yeah. end separately, because without knowing a few more of the specifics, I, I'm not sure that we're going to be particularly helpful. Yeah. Also, Sorry, that's not meant to be a cop-out. Do, do you come no. and see us at the end? OK, so I'll just move to the last question now. A uh, person just in the, the... Yeah, that's it. Lady with a waving her programme. That's it. Hi there. Um, I've been really interested in what you're saying about um, the way people write their funding applications. Um, and I'm interested in, in what you think about the way people write their biographies. Um, my name is Jo Forrest. I work with several organisations who employ young musicians. Um, I also often have the task of pulling together the programmes. Um, and as an audience member, and as someone who pulls together the programmes, the biographies can be a nightmare for various reasons. We could run a whole session on that. So what would you, as a bunch of professionals sitting up there, recommend um, to a young musician to focus on in their biography? Right, I think I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to wrap this up. So there we go. 
Uh, I'm starting with you, Rebecca. 30 um, seconds. I think you need to be concise. It's about who, what, when, why. Try and be brief. Try not to use the words that everyone uses, unique, um, whatever they are. I can't think of what the others are on the top of my head. But, and also read lots of other biographies that are out there so that you get a flavour for what other people are saying. And don't necessarily copy them, but start to know what those really overused phrases are so that you can avoid them <coughs> and try and have some distinction. Claire, do you want to add anything? Just think of three things that you'd want someone to remember about you and give what you write to somebody else, get them to read it, get them to t take it away and ask them to tell it back to you. If they've remembered the key things, you've got it right. If not, start again. Very good advice. Tom, your thoughts? Um, I hate biographies. <laughs> um, and I've not updated mine for about too long. So there you are. Um, short and quirky and not, I, I love biographies which really take a different twist. So I, I mean, one example would be to look at Anna Bilsma, the Dutch cellist's biography, who always does something quirky. He's a quirky character, he's a wonderful musician. So take inspiration from, from those kind of people. Okay. Uh, oh. Sorry, just very quickly. If in doubt, look at dating sites. <laughs> Good tip. They, seriously, they help you write things quickly and to the point. Somebody told me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Top business tip. I think we need to tweet that now, Eagle. <laughs> I, uh, I, um, I completely disagree. I, I mean, putting my answer to hat on, I, I, I really, actually, I, I never read biography because they don't tell me the three things that I always want to know <laughs> as a music critic and an arts editor, which is what year you were born, where were you born and what nationality you are? I mean, those are really interesting things that they never tell you. Um, they tell you, you know, all sorts of other crap that I have no and, interest in. And just, okay. to, just, yeah. just, so just to that, really to just to that person at the back, I think you should be really pleased that no one's taking your music seriously. I think the greatest composers were not taken seriously at your age. This is a really good badge of honour. <laughs> OK, um, yeah, just very briefly, Michelle, anything else you want to add to the biography <laughs> question? So, um, simple, distinctive, and I think, you know, don't tell everybody everything, because it's so boring. You really yeah. need to, like, you know, what, what do you want to be known for again? What are the two or three things that you want to be known for? I mean, one thing I would just add is every biography I seem to read, every artist seems to be the, the next artist of their generation or yeah. the artist of their generation. <laughs> I do never put that. Never put it. Okay, we Unless don't... Unless you are. We don't use that. <laughs> <laughs> And, you, and, and there are a few who are, I put, you know, so don't put it. I think that's a brilliant note to end on. Thank you so much to this fabulous panel. Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs>